Back in the early 90s, CD-ROM drives came to market and manufacturers started to add multimedia stickers on their PCs. There was actually an attempt to define different levels of multimedia PCs by the Multimedia PC Marketing Council in 1991. The MPMC comprised companies including Microsoft, Creative Labs, Dell, Gateway and Fujitsu. The standard failed and I've actually never seen one of the official logos on any PC. Probably because of the licensing fee involved. But multimedia PCs certainly didn't fail. Today we're going to restore and upgrade an IBM first generation Optiva multimedia PC. I have two of these 2144 machines here for comparison. We are of course going to make it as fast as we possibly can. At least with the stuff I have. I think there were at least 10 different variants of these machines. Although when I compared these two machines with two other variants, I found that they were almost identical. In fact, I couldn't spot the difference. I did some research, but I couldn't find any info about which one was the first, the fastest, the slowest, the budget or the best. But what I think we have on the bench today is the low-end and high-end machine. Let's have a look inside these machines and see how they differ. To get inside one of these machines you just push on the front cover and it will pop open and give you access to the drives. I have snatched the CD-ROM from this machine for another project. Inside here we have a label with the specs. I think this is the low-end Optiva because it came with a DX250 and only 4 megs of RAM. And this is what I think was the high-end machine of these first generation Optivas. If we have a look inside the sticker says DX266 and 4 megs of RAM. But that is actually not a big difference between these two machines, as we will see once we look inside. The most common fault with these machines that I have seen are broken off front covers. And these early Optivas actually have a very similar case as the late PS1s had. You may recognize this machine from one of my previous videos. And aside from the front cover, these chassis are very similar. In fact, they actually look interchangeable. And here is our missing CD-ROM drive, by the way. I snatched it because this PS1 came without. And as far as I know, these machines were never sold with a CD-ROM drive. So let's start with a low-end machine. Apparently I left a sticker here that says FPM only. And then we've got a Sound Blaster CT2770. And I think that's the original card that came with this machine. Down here is the DX250. It's without the heatsink in this machine, but I think that might be my doing. Because if I remember correctly, this is the 486 that came with this machine. And I think I needed to borrow it for another project. So we'll put it back in. And next we can see some empty pads for cash. So if you want to hack one of these, you might be able to add some cash on the board. And probably one or two jumpers to make it work. Although there are some empty pads for a chip here, very close to the cash. So you might need that chip too. Let's start by removing that sound blaster. And nothing much to say about this. There are some empty pads for pin headers for a creative drive. And behind the sound card we can see that this machine has four ISA slots and no VLB. However, down here at the board there is actually a Sirius Logic GD5426. So it's quite possible that this machine actually doesn't need any VLB slots. Because in the PS1 I just showed, that Sirius Logic chip is hooked up directly to the local bus, so it already has awesome graphics. However, the 5426 is actually made to work with local bus graphics or the ISA bus, so we won't know until we make the benchmarks. Up here we have two RAM chips, so this machine probably has one meg of VRAM. Over here are our RAM sticks, and apparently it's FPM only, and I'm pretty sure I have added these sticks since this machine came with 4 megs only. Tucked in under the RAM stick is a coin cell, so no nasty leaky batteries in this machine. And apparently it's an Opti chipset. 
And here is where it starts to get quirky, as it often does with IBMs. To remove the diskette drive, we have to remove this screw here. And then we need to detach the razor board from this large bracket here. And being an IBM, it obviously has bolt head screws. And I just realized that this case is slightly different from the PS1. Because on the PS1, this piece here was attached to this large bracket here, and they came out in one piece. But apparently, this machine has two screws to hold the diskette drive separately. And it comes off first. And then we have to remove these screws here for the CD-ROM cradle. And one more screw on the side here. And now I think this entire bracket here comes out with the hard drive attached to it. And it's a Maxtor drive, model 7270AV, manufactured in January of 1995. And apparently Maxtor aims for total customer satisfaction. Well, I'm pretty satisfied with vintage hard drives. Let's just hope it's not too noisy. And overall, this case is very sturdy. This bracket here and the rest of the chassis is made out of really thick steel. And I guess that might be one of the reasons why IBMs were more expensive and eventually lost the race. And there is a cover back here that we need to figure out how to remove without breaking it. Well, there's a plastic tab inside here in the middle. Let's try to push on it and see what happens. And yes, that was the trick. And none of the tabs broke. Awesome, so good plastics. And the power supply is not identical to the power supply in the PS1. This is a much larger international power supply. And that is a good thing, because I had to repair the power supply twice in my PS1. Not the easiest power connector to reach. The locking tab is squeezed in between the connector and the power supply. So we may actually have to remove the power supply first to be able to remove the connectors. Oh man, those are really jammed. I think we're gonna have to add some dioxide on these connectors for sure. And unlike most of my clones, if not all, the power switch only has a very thin cable here. And it's hooked up to the motherboard instead of going directly to the power supply. And the connectors are really stuck on this board. And there isn't really much else to see here. We've got a UMC chip here. And over here we've got a couple of chips with numbers that don't really tell me much. And the Sirius Logic chip here is dated week 1 of 1995. The Opti chip is made in week 45 of 1984. So I guess this machine was made very early in 1995 and I'm gonna go ahead and remove the motherboard too or the plane arm as IBM likes to call these because I'm going to do some cleaning off camera and then we're going to do some benchmarks and comparisons and apparently the board is also held in place with a couple of plastic clips and it probably helps if I actually remove all the screws first and that was the last screw. Okay, let's move on to what I think was a high-end model of these early 2144s. So first we've got a sound card. And underneath the sound card is the interesting bit. So let's get that out. So check this out. This machine actually has a VLB slot. And we may actually not need it. Because that's a Sirius Logic GD5430. And that's a local bus chip. So if I'm not mistaken, this machine already has local bus graphics straight out of the back. Let's check if that is actually a VLB slot and not something weird and wonderful from IBM. I think we need to remove this bracket here to see if a card will fit. And it does. So yeah, that's definitely a regular VLB slot. That is not a common sight among IBMs. So this should be a pretty fast Optiva when we're done with it. And the CD-ROM drive is an IBM branded double speed drive. Can't really tell who made it. Okay, I skipped ahead here a bit because the disassembly was identical to the other machine. 
And aside from the Series Logic chip I mentioned, it also has an Opti chipset. But it's a completely different board with a completely different set of chips. And this board also has a second IDE channel. And at least according to my old sticker, this board can take FPM and EDU RAM. And a really odd thing about this board is this large connector here that has been completely filled up with jumpers. I have never seen anything like it. I have no idea what it does. And this board also has sockets for cache. So I will do some cleaning and treat the front panels of the diskette drives off camera. And we will move on with some benchmarks. Okay, all the bits and pieces are cleaned up. Let's start with some benchmarks. I had some compatibility issues with this board. It was very picky with hard drives. So I had to try several period correct drives. And apparently this fireball works well. So that's what we'll use. And to make a fair comparison, we're gonna go with a DX266 on both boards. At least initially, and then we will try something faster. And this is what I think is the slower board. And since it doesn't support EDO RAM, we're gonna go with 8 megs of FP RAM on both boards. And in the first test here, we're gonna go with a Cirrus Logic ISA card, because that way we can compare it with the onboard graphics and see if that 5426 is hooked up to the local bus or the ISA bus. Well, it's pretty slow, but I wasn't expecting too much with this setup. And for some reason, this board isn't compatible with the ET4000. I did try it, but for some reason, it wouldn't boot. I just got one line of text. I think it said 1 meg VRAM. But I've had this issue before with this card, so I'm not sure if I should blame the motherboard. And we've got 4685 real ticks. And that only gives us 15.9 FPS. So pretty slow. So let's remove that ISA card. And re-enable the onboard graphics with J15 here. And see if this makes a significant improvement. Well, this actually was a bit faster. I mean, it's definitely playable. And we did get an improvement. So we've got 3370 real ticks. And that gives us 22.2 FPS. So I'd say that chip is probably hooked up to the local bus. It's not a perfect comparison. Because that ISA card is a 5422. And the onboard chip is a 5426. And that is the closest I could get with the stuff I have. Now let's see how fast this board will go. On the 5x86. This is a 5 volt only board. So we're going to use the socket blaster. And found the jumper settings online for a very similar board. So I was able to set the speed to 33 MHz. Okay, doom running with the 5x86. And this is way faster. This is definitely playable. However, this board lacks the jumper to change the 5x86 to 4x mode. So, as it is right now, it's actually running as a DX4. But a viewer left a comment in one of the PS1 videos that the 5x86 could be hacked by grounding a pin. So I left a message to the creator of the socket blaster. And apparently the jumper that slows down the DX4 in the socket blaster can also set the 5x86 in 4x mode. So we're gonna try that in a second. But first we got 2751 real takes. And that gives us 27.16 FPS. Which isn't very impressive even for a DX4. So let's change that jumper. And try again. And yes, it works. So check this out. Now check CPU reports, 5x86, running at 134.2 MHz, uh, we've got a clock multiplier of 4, that is awesome. So let's run Doom, well it's kind of hard to see the difference, but this is quick and definitely playable, especially for an ISA only machine, so I'm not very impressed by this board, but this is a pretty massive improvement. I'd say most people would have been pretty happy playing Doom at this speed back in the day. And we've got 2604 real ticks. And this gives us 
28.9 FPS. So not a huge improvement from a DX4. Now I may sound like I'm bashing down on this board, but I'm not because 29 FPS. That is actually enough to play tons and tons of great DOS games. Okay, let's try the VLB board. And for comparison, I'm using the same RAM stakes, the same DX266, and the same Series Logic graphics card. And it looks about the same as the other card, the way it's set up right now. And I guess it should give us about the same score. And we've got 4445 real takes. And that gives us 16.8 FPS. So slightly faster than the other board. But not by much. Okay, let's see what it does with EDU RAM. And apparently it's a bit picky with RAM. So I had to go through a decent stack before I found a stick that didn't crash in Doom. I don't think EDU RAM makes much difference. But it should be slightly faster. And we've got the same score. 4445 real ticks. So this board doesn't seem to care much about EDU RAM. Now let's see if that serious logic. 5430 is hooked up to the ISA bus or the local bus. Okay, here goes. Let's see if we have local bus graphics or not. I think we do. And we've got 3881 real takes. Well, I'm not sure to be honest, because we've got 19.2 FPS. But this is easy to test. We can just add a VLB card. Okay, here goes Doom. And we've got 3421 real takes. And that gives us 21.8 FPS. So that is not too far from the onboard 5430. It kind of feels a bit inconclusive. Maybe we have a bottleneck somewhere. Well, I'm also hoping for something more conclusive. Like a much bigger difference. But this is what we have. I wonder if it's possible to check with a multimeter. I mean, if it's hooked up to the local bus then shouldn't it go directly to the 486? Or does it go through a chip on its way? But let's move on and see how fast we can make this board go. Well, we've got nothing on the screen. So that's no good. Let's try with an ODPR100. And see if the problem is with the board. Or the socket blaster. And it posts. Okay, so something is wrong with my socket blaster. I uh, better test it on another board. Oh no, it works on this board. So that means we have some weird compatibility issue. Well, there's no easy fix for that. Well, I've got a spare board and it's identical. And this board has bad graphics, but it does work with a VLB card. So let's try the socket blaster in this board. Okay, fingers crossed. Let's see if this works. And uh, no, it doesn't. So for some reason, the 5x86 is preventing these boards to display any graphics. The sound I'm getting from the hard drive implies that it actually boots. But we've got no graphics. What a disappointment. Well, let's see if we have enough power. Well, 5 volts in is good. And we're getting 3.46 out. That is spot on. That is perfect. So, not a power issue either. Well, in that case, I have no idea what might be causing this. If you have any thoughts, please share. Let's try with an ODPR and see how it behaves. And it posts. So apparently this board works with an ODPR 100. And it even recognizes it as a DX4 in the BIOS. Unlike the PS1. Let's try Doom. Well, it's definitely playable. So it's not a slow machine. But I was hoping for a lot more. And we've got 2790 real ticks. And that gives us 26.8 FPS. So this faster VLB board 
is actually slightly slower than the non-VLB board because we can't use the 5x86. Well, let's fill the board up with cash and see if we can reach 30 FPS this week. And hopefully this is an issue that might be resolved. Okay, 256k of level 2 cash installed. And I think the ODPR has 16k of cash. But in the BIOS here it just says enabled. Let's try a speed SUS and see if it actually recognizes all that cache. Because if you have watched the PS1 videos, you know it required a BIOS hack to actually access the cache. So let's make sure that's not our problem here. Okay, it drops at 16k. And it should drop right here. Uh, 256 and it does so the cache seems to be working So let's jump over to doom. Okay, here goes with 256 K of cache Well, I definitely wouldn't mind playing this game at this speed And we've got 2316 real ticks and Yes, we passed 30 FPS 32.2 to be exact so I thought we would get more today, but this is not bad, because we have doubled the speed. Well, in that case, it's time for my favorite part of any project, the reassembly. Now let's put the lid back on and it comes on with a very satisfying click. That is one good looking machine. Well done IBM. If you have any thoughts about why the 5x86 gives us trouble on this machine, please share below. When I have a few things to try out, I will make a video. Now that we know how to set the 5x86 in 4x mode, I'm going to record the next PS1 video and see if we can take it to over 40 FPS. And now is a good time to watch the video where we restore the supposedly unupgradable IBM PS1 SX25 and overclocked it to 38.6 FPS. If you want to join me in the next video, hit the bell icon below and set it to all. I would like to end this video by saying thank you to my patrons. If you want to help me make more videos like this, you will find the link in the description below. Thank you for watching, like, subscribe, and I'll start recording the next video.